uh, Dr. Ntlabu, I think we can start now. Thank you very much, Renir. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name is Dr. Vusin Tlapo. I'm the Chief Executive of the SA Medical Association. I'd like to welcome you all tonight to this second session on primary care management of COVID-19 webinar. It is indeed a great honor to have all you here tonight for what promises to be an informative as well as an interesting evening. Webinars as this are very important and form an integral part of our continued learning. And I'm grateful that we have brought together such an good esteemed good evening. panel of speakers tonight for tonight's presentation. There are two major issues which make this webinar particularly significant. Firstly, we have assembled an excellent and a highly rated panel of speakers. Secondly, we are looking at the latest evidence-based data, which is backed up by case studies. I am sure that you will agree that these are two factors that are important to ensuring the credibility of the information we are about to hear. My colleague, Dr. Norbert Njaka, who is the National Director for Drug-Resistant TB Care at the National Department of Health, and Professor Andrew Parrish, Head of Clinical Department, Internal Medicine Services at Walter Sisulu University will moderate the two sessions this evening. I'm looking forward to what will be presented tonight, and I hope that you will equally find the sessions not only informative, but uh, influential in terms of the way that you practice medicine today. It is therefore my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Njeka to this virtual podium and to provide an overview of tonight's proceedings. Dr. Njeka, over to you. Thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ntapo, for uh, your kind words of, of introduction. Uh, colleagues, we have a very good program um, tonight. We, we, we're aiming at improving quality of uh, uh, COVID care that we provide to our patient. And, and as you know, evidence-based is, is is our buzzword. We, we want you to have evidence-based um, management of primary, uh, of, of COVID at primary care. And we'll be discussing a program, pragmatic approach to care and promote ongoing uh, critical appraisal skills. So that's what we, we're going to be doing tonight. And we decided to really uh, bring, like you had from Dr. Nklapo, a, a, a group of uh, excellent uh, panelists that, that are going to take us through. But before that, we're going to start with uh, someone from the National Department of Health, uh, Trudy Leung, uh, that will be talking to us about the, the guidelines process, how reviews are done, and, and all that. Trudy serves at the Department of Health uh, under the Essential Drugs uh, Program. Uh, she's specifically coordinate and support the review of uh, NDOH primary healthcare and the audit, the adult hospital level standard uh, treatment guidelines and essential uh, medicine list. Uh, she does support the process of rapid review of therapeutic for management of COVID. Uh, I'll ask Trudy to, to present. And then um, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Jeremy Nell after Trudy. Uh, Jeremy does, in, does no longer need the introduction. He's an infectious disease specialist at Vert University. Uh, he's got numerous uh, publications in the field of, of infectious diseases, tuberculosis. Uh, he's involved with uh, student trainings at Vert and he's been involved as well with clinical trials. So uh, those are the two individuals that I'll be introducing to you. And others will be introduced by, by uh, Professor Parrish. Uh, let's hear from Trudy, what's the process of production of our guidelines? We like saying that our guidelines are of very good quality. Um, so I want you to tell the audience, what do we mean by a uh, good quality? and evidence-based guidelines. Over to you, Trudy. 
Um, thank you very much, Dr. Njeka, and good evening to all. Um, so, Renier, I just want to know, can I try and share my slides um, and see what happens? If you can, everybody can just tell me if you can see anything. Can you see my slides? Yeah, we can see yes. the black blocks on that side. So um, I think you can share your camera on that side. I'll, see, I'll share the slides on my side. Okay, so you're not seeing anything? No. No, can see the slides. You can see the slides. Okay, I'm going to share my I'm going to share my slides then. Your slides have disappeared. <laughs> okay. Right. That's so true. Before you start, <laughs> before, sorry. Before you start, we can see those black blocks on there. So if you want me to share it on this side, it's fine. All right. Super. Thank you very much. Um, you can just put your camera on so that people can see um, who's talking now. Um, just give me a moment to start the slide on this side. Thank you very much, Rini. So, as mentioned by Dr. Njeka, I'm going to present on the processes for the conducting of the rapid reviews for COVID-19 therapeutics and the development of the National Department of COVID um, Clinical Guidelines for COVID, all evidence-based, as Dr. Njeka mentioned. Thank you very much, Rini. Next slide. So we all acknowledge we live in unprecedented times and I provided a very quick update of what's happening in South Africa. Our caseload is still relatively high, as you can see, and there's a 51% vaccination rate as of the 15th of February, 2022. Next slide, please. So the pandemic required a multi-sectorial approach and all directors within the National Department of Health needed to band together to provide a COVID-19 response. Um, the respective ministerially appointed committees, as you can see in the COVID-19 block over there, um, or MACs as we call them, were established to advise the Minister of Health. And this included the NAMLAC MAC on COVID-19 therapeutics, the, obviously the Ministry Advisory Committee on COVID-19, um, your MAC on social behaviour change, the MAC on vaccines, and all of these were supported by various directorates within the National Department of Health. These advisories were then considered for implementation as required by the NDOH and informs the national COVID-19 related guidelines. The respective deliverables, as you can see on the slide, are indicated in red, which include the rapid reviews on COVID-19 over here, um, and obviously the various advisories and the National Department of Health guidelines. I've also added the National Essential Medicines List Committee on the slide, um, ministerially appointed as well, as they are, um, they develop the ACGs and EML, which actually informs the symptom symptomatic management of COVID. Next slide, I mean, if you can just enter. And again. So this pr slide provides a very high overview of two distinctive steps in the process. The first one was the development of advisories and evidence reviews, which is done by the MACs and the supportive directorates, and implementation of the advisories, which I think is a very key step, um, and of the rapid review recommendations done by the National Department of Health. Thank you, next slide. This is a slide that shares an important source of the National Department of Health COVID-19 resources, which is on the Knowledge Hub platform and the URL link is provided below. Next slide, please. So I'm based in the Affordable Medicines Directorate, so I'd like to focus on the COVID-19 therapeutic um, um, aspects. Next slide, please. So this is what a rapid review looks like. It's the front page and it's a snapshot. Um, these rapid reviews connect, are conducted by the NIMLAP MAC um, with supporting reviewers on COVID-19 therapeutics, includes the title, as you can see on the top, the date, indicating if this is an update of a previous review, the question, the key findings, the recommendation, and as you can see, the recommendation includes the strength of the recommendation, as well as the certainty of the evidence using the grade approach. Note that the NIMLAC had established a subcommittee on Mar in March 2020 to provide advisories 
um, through a virtual rapid review process. But later on, they, had been, they were established as a freestanding ministerial advisory committee to the Minister of Health on the 24th of August, 2021. The URL link for these rapid reviews are also available on the website and the link has been provided. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very busy slide, but it basically provides an overview of the complete rapid review process, which I say is a very robust process. It's a schematic summary of the generic protocol that is used, which is followed for all the rapid reviews. And this rapid review protocol is also available on the, um, the, the various platforms, which I indicated, the NDIH website and the Knowledge Hub platform. I'd like to draw your attention to the generic PICO um, question over here. Um, um, the PICO format is used for the research question and is guided by the severity of the disease. And important to note, some of the internationally recognized standardized tools um, over here that is used um, to appraise the evidence. Also reviews are undertaken not by a single person, by teams that consist of two methodologists as well as clinicians on the forefront. So essentially this whole process tells you about a rapid systematic evidence synthesis approach. Next slide, please. So as evidence emerge, emerged um, with, um, in the COVID space and it was emerging very rapidly, as we all know, there was an expectation um, for the committee to update the reviews every time new evidence um, was published or became available, which was really impossible. So the committee developed a framework to update the reviews, and this was based on the strength of the current recommendation, which is this over here, as well as the type of evidence that was forthcoming, whether the evidence was moderate or weak or very weak, and most of the case, very, very, very weak. Next slide, please. The therapeutic rapid reviews then informs the national COVID guidelines of the clinical management of suspected or confirmed COVID-19 disease, but more specifically, the therapeutic module five. The latest version is accessible through the Knowledge Hub um, and the URL link is uh, displayed on the slide. So as new evidence emerges, the rapid reviews are updated and in turn, the drug therapy module of the COVID-19 clinical guidelines are updated as required. So it's a living um, process. Next slide. So I've provided a summary of the key URL links to the important resources, but here at the bottom, I've also included the link to the national appeals policy with the selection of essential medicines. It um, would be very uh, it would be for your interest to actually go and have a look at those various documents. Thank you. Next slide. So thank you for your time. So in a nutshell, I've provided a very high, high overview of the NDOH process. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Njeka. Thank you so much, uh, Trudy. That, that's really uh, appreciated. So. Now, now we can start with our case study number one that will be presented by uh, Dr. Dr. Jeremy Nell, and and that will be um, guidance on uh, case management, looking at testing, isolation, and quarantine issues. Uh, over to you, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Jacob. So, uh, evening, everyone. So. Uh, by popular request, um, we decided to deal with uh, quarantine and isolation because that has changed recently. Um, and just to, to flesh that out a little bit and provide some of the rationales, at least um, as they've been given. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. So this is a, a case. So you, in this case, make it personal, have had a headache, uh, myalgia and diarrhea for the past two days. You decide to test for COVID. Your test comes back positive. It doesn't really matter whether it was PCR or rapid, but it's positive. You're symptomatic in a way that could be COVID, and so it's very likely that that's a true positive. And the question obviously then comes, how long should you isolate for? So the initial guidance, um, this takes us way back to the beginning of, um, of COVID, and the initial guidance then was following the WHO, which suggested that you needed two negative tests before de-isolating. This is before we knew anything about COVID. 
Uh, South Africa was, if not the first, then certainly in in the first few countries in the world to be, to move to a time based de isolation period, where looking at um, some early evidence about uh, how long the virus was able to be cultured, it showed that even if your PCR was positive after a certain point, you may well not be infectious. And that's been a key uh, distinction that, um, that's really been running through the, the, the degree in terms of isolation for a long time. So because we're not trying to wait for a negative test, like some countries persist in doing, and, and inappropriately, I think, in my view, um, it's really just about a time-based thing. So what was the first time? Initially, we said 14 days, and that was really mostly, I guess, we were, we were part, there was very little evidence at the time. So we, we gave it a longer, er, er on the side of a longer isolation period with better evidence with, was able to be reduced to 10, and then now down to potentially seven. So what about your family though at home and your work colleagues? Do they need to test? Do they need to quarantine? So these are the, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of uh, guidance. So let's look at the rationale for why we think it's, we can move it down to seven days, which is the latest in terms of isolation, which is the latest um, re recommendation and why the Department of Health has moved away from quarantining completely. And just a reminder of the difference, isolation is for you if you test positive or the patient test positive. So people who are, do have the disease isolate. People who've been exposed to the disease, but as far as we know, don't have it, they quarantine. So we've done away with quarantining people with exposures to people who are positive and shortened the isolation period. So we're in a different place than we were two years ago, and that's driving some of these changes. Um, there's a lot of immunity going around the population at this point. Sadly, the majority of that immunity comes from previous exposure to COVID, in other words, from previous infections. Uh, there were several surveys suggesting from rural and urban areas in multiple provinces, a uh, number in excess of 70% of people before Omicron uh, came through. And so after Omicron, that number we don't know yet, but could conceivably be more than 80%. And that's a huge number of people. That means about, let's say, three quarters to four fifths of South Africans have had COVID. Um, we'll come to why that number is so high in, in some sense. But the key thing that we, we now seeing is that the Omicron wave has really not so much uncoupled because of some of the um, some of the epidemiologists don't love that word because they're still linked, but there's a bigger gap between the caseload and the severity. In other words, there's a higher proportion of mild cases this time. And we do know as well that containment strategies are less and less useful and less and less efficacious. For example, these are much more infectious variants than, than was the ancestral variant. Um, and they're much more transmissible and, and some degree of immune escape as well. And then we know more things about the virus. We know that a high proportion of people are asymptomatic. The highest number was found in South Africa, the Cheryl Cohen's uh, uh, first C study, which put it well above three quarters, which is um, an astounding number. Some Many other surveys are quite a lot lower than that, but it's still a big proportion, whatever it is. Um, there's a large amount of asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spreads. So you don't have to have symptoms. And of course, you can spread the disease from aerosols, these tiny particles which can stay suspended in the air for a long time. The big thing about quarantining and why we've moved away from it in the country is that we never identify enough people, enough of the right people to quarantine in the first place. And the big reason is that we don't identify most of the cases. And remember, I said about 70, 80 percent of South Africans have probably had COVID. That's if you look at antibody evidence for that. And yet the number diagnosed is maybe one-tenth of that or one-fifteenth of that. So it's much smaller. So why do we miss so many people? Well, one big reason is you can be asymptomatic and then you won't test, of course, because we, we very seldom test asymptomatic people. Um, also, if you do get symptoms, you may decide that you don't want to test because, well, it's minor, you don't think it's COVID, or maybe you do think it's COVID, but the testing station's a long way away, or you have to take a day off work, or it's expensive to get tested, or for any one of the many, many reasons, or your wife's just tested positive, so you, your sniffles are going to be COVID, why, why bother testing? Many people don't test, even if they do get symptoms, and we know many people don't get symptoms in the beginning. And then lastly, we know that the tests themselves are not that great. Um, they probably the PCR test is maybe around 70% uh, sensitive. In other words, we'll still miss um, a, a degree of uh, infections as well, even if they, you do have uh, COVID. Other thing is that with aerosol spread as well, we only ever quarantined high risk contacts. And they were people, for example, within a meter and a half for more than 15 to 20 minutes. 
But with aerosol spread, that doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. Uh, the aerosol spread much more widely than that. Uh, the time, the 15 minutes is fairly arbitrary, especially when you're dealing with more infectious variants. And of course, the effects of getting COVID now are less if you've, if you've got some degree of immunity. And there's lot, lots of immunity in the population now. Um, it's also very costly, and this can't be overemphasized enough. We know the downsides of quarantine in terms of the number of people it takes off out the hospitals, out the uh, police stations, out the schools, out businesses. It's a huge cost to society. Um, and really, so you need, really need a very good rationale to quarantine. We don't tend to quarantine for most infections anyway, at least those uh, which are going to be around for a while time, uh, uh, a long time. And the adherence anyway of this is pretty erratic. But the big thing is that first point. We're not finding the cases, and therefore we're not finding the context of the cases by definition. If you don't know someone's positive, you don't know who to quarantine. And that's the big reason why quarantining is just from a public health perspective, very, very limited in what it can do. Oops. Um, so uh, the recommendation there was that this is from the Department of Health, that the quarantine should be discontinued for contacts of cases of COVID-19. Um, they didn't distinguish between vaccinated and unvaccinated people, so it applies to both groups. And just remember again, if you know you're a contact, uh, we, you don't have to quarantine, but you also don't have to test. We, we never did recommend testing unless you needed to get back earlier uh, to work if you're a so-called essential worker, but it, it, it really is not something. So if, if you happen to be exposed to someone, well, it's nice to know, I suppose, but remember that you were statistically exposed to another 10 to 15 people that you didn't know about. Um, and so it's really a drop in the ocean. Um, Isolation, so why? So that's really quarantine, and that's why, from a public health perspective, the utility is pretty limited. From an isolation perspective, now remember, isolation is if you've got the infection. So it's really saying here um, if you have COVID 19, how long should you stay away from? Much the same rationale applies, except that you at least can get some bang for your buck because you know the person is, is likely to be infectious. So um, again, excuse me, again, we, we, don't, we miss many of the infectious people anyway for the same reason I just mentioned. Um, Big other thing with isolation, why it's got a limited public health utility, again, is that it also depends on you isolating very quickly. Um, and most of the transmission, unfortunately, occurs either just a couple of days before you start getting symptoms or at the day of symptoms. And of course, people usually don't test on day one. They may go test on day two or three, and then it takes another day to get the test result back. So by that time, it's sort of two, three days, three, four days after symptoms have started. And by that stage, the vast majority of transmissions that are going to occur have occurred. And so isolation, again, is pretty limited in terms of what it's doing at a public health level. I mean, it's, again, costly and um, to society again. This was a, a slide that Juliet Pulliam put together, um, looking at uh, some, of the, some of the evidence and really putting it together. I just want to show you the concept. The numbers are not exactly important because this is a model, but really to show you the concept. In the dotted lines, these are two different studies which estimated infectiousness. Um, uh, and the dotted lines really show if you isolate someone, let's say one, two, three, four, five days after they start getting symptoms, you can prevent here, this is in percent on the left line, so it's 0.5 is 50%. You might reduce maybe half the infections because remember half of them have already occurred um, by the time you isolate them. So if this is you isolate four or five days rather. If you isolate them for another two days to seven days, you can see you get probably just a little bit more after seven days, so there's really very little benefit to isolating someone for that much longer. Um, not to say zero benefit, but, but very little, uh, and the trade-off is quite extreme. Is on the bottom here on the solid lines is the actual effect on the population because we diagnose so few people in the first place. So when you factor that in, you can see that you basically, no matter what you do with isolation, whether you make it one day or a million days, you're not going to have a big public health benefit. You can probably max out here at what is this, uh, certainly under 10% of infections that you can reduce. Um, but again, there's some benefits, but there's probably still a role for isolating at some point. And, and this model, again, really was as kind as we could be to the isolation. There's many assumptions there that if they don't hold would make this model show even less use to isolation. So again, it's uh, from a public health perspective, not hugely useful. From an individual perspective, you know the person in front of you is infectious, it still is reasonable to isolate them for a period. But we thought overall it could move from 10 days to seven days as a good trade-off. And then lastly, um, again, just to remind yourselves that the impact of these transmissions is less severe. We do have to move away gradually from caring about infections to much more focusing on caring about severity. Um, and so 
we can see here, this is a slide from the bottom from the NICD, the huge number of cases in the Omicron wave, but at the top there from the SA uh, MRC, really not the same burden of deaths. Uh, this is the excess deaths. Um, sorry, this is the, the total number of deaths, but it's really including excess deaths to show um, uh, the, the, the fact that really this last wave over here was much less deadly than previous waves have been. Um, it's still a huge role for vaccination, clearly, whether you've had COVID or not. This shouldn't be taken to, to relax you, or your guard. In fact, if anything, this is the reason to make sure you're up to date with your vaccinations. But again, it's just to show that the effects here are relatively, um, you know, this is a different phase of the pandemic. And so it, it's another factor to take into account when you're doing, trying to do isolation quarantine uh, uh, guidelines. And when you're thinking about what to do with these patients, is that the, the downsides of catching infection are somewhat less. And I don't mean to trivialize that, there's still a lot of death here but a lot less than previous waves. Uh, and a lot more people are protected uh, through some combination of vaccination and or previous infection. Um, so the isolation period was reduced by the Department of Health to seven days if you're symptomatic. If you're asymptomatic, controversially, the guidance said not to isolate at all. Um, and the reason really for that is that these PCR tests particularly take it can be positive for weeks. So if you, if you, unless you're testing regularly, if you just go and test, for example, um, and you don't have any symptoms, a positive result might mean that you were infectious two weeks ago or three weeks ago, and you, this is just still a positive test. And given the pr pretty limited benefits from a public health perspective, it kind of made sense to not even bother with isolation for that group of people. If you're following them regularly, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, there's, a, there's perhaps a different rationale. And then again, don't test to de-isolate. I mentioned already, we, we haven't done this for years in South Africa. We've actually been ahead of the, the curve in that regard. But this is just another reminder to do it. So then the, as the last slide really is just the nuances about this because it was produced in Department of Health Circular, which was pretty terse. And, and really some of the other messaging to fill, fill it out, I think is important. One thing which is really important is that the isolation is not the same as a sick leave period. In other words, you just because you can de-isolate at seven days doesn't mean you necessarily are fit to return to work. You might be very severely ill and need a lot longer. So it's just a reminder that uh, workplace policies need to take into account not just isolation, but also fitness to return to work. And then what about asymptomatic people? Because a very common question, who test positive in a hospital environment? Well, you should probably cohort them still with other positives. Um, and then the same sort of idea, if you happen to do weekly testing at workplaces, again, if they test positive, you can treat them as if they're positive and symptomatic and still do them for seven days. Because these, again, you, you can tie the infectious period pretty closely to it. One thing, though, just to end off with is really this need, I think, in general, to move away from testing of asymptomatic people in general. We, we do have to move away. This is not a sustainable strategy long term for testing. And we really need to be concentrating going forward and learning to live with the virus in terms of really the, the, the people in whom it's going to make a difference, such as those severely ill or, or at very high risk. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Jacob. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeremy Nell. There are a few questions. Uh, on the chat I've been monitoring. I think uh, the th three are very important. Um, the, the one goes to summer, but I think you, you, you can give your view as, as a presenter uh, in, in terms of the anti-vexers, these people who are against the vaccines. Um, what is summer doing? But I, I don't know uh, whether Dr. Antlapo is online, but maybe we should hear your view, what, what should government be doing about this? Because I think it's a, it's a very serious problem. Uh, the other question is around return to work. Uh, what about the risk of, for those with comorbidity uh, if they become you know, positive to Omicron? You know, uh, what's, what's your comment around that? And the last question someone wanted to know, you said PCR is 70% sensitive. Uh, if you could explain that, is that correct? Over to you. Uh, sure, I can take a crack at them. So, I mean, I can't obviously speak for Sama, but in terms of the government, in terms of anti-vaxxers, I think, look, that's, that's a webinar on its own probably, but I, I do think that a lot of the polls, at least locally, have suggested that while there are obviously people who are just not reachable in terms of being hardcore anti-vaxxers, there's a lot more vaccine hesitancy and then even most worrying in, in a sense is that there's a lot of people who do are keen for the vaccine or at least are, are, re, are not averse to it in the slightest, but just it's the access isn't quite there. So 
to me, I think that, you know, there's, there's certainly, and this is also from the WHO's guidance, as far as I'm aware as well, I mean, if you consider this as really a problem of concentric rings of different forms of, of, of not taking the vaccine, the ones we really want to get in the, in the country and are really available from the Department of Health perspective, I think, is to increase access as much as possible. So go to people's workplaces, go to rural areas, decrease the barriers in terms of people getting, um, getting registered and getting tested as far as possible, because there really does seem to, there do, don't seem to be a huge number of hardcore anti-vaxxers in South Africa. It really is mostly a problem of vaccine hesitancy or, or lack of access, I think, as far as I can uh, ascertain, sorry, ascertain rather. Um, the return to work, so we did comment a little bit, I think probably after the question was, was typed a little bit about that. Um, so the risk with, for, for those with comorbidities, if they become positive with Omicron, so uh, Omicron on average um, is producing a bit less severe disease, but the, it's very difficult to disentangle the contribution from an intrinsically less virulent virus like Omicron probably is a little bit with the effect, effect of this population immunity of protection. And most of the severe, uh, difference in severity probably was the pre-existing immunity rather than any changes. So it's really a, a, a thing to say that if you are comorbid, if you do have comorbidities, you're high risk, and even if you aren't, Really, again, vaccination is still the key to prevent um, severe disease here. Uh, and don't rely on the fact that, you know, the Omicron wave was a bit milder. Most of that was because of the pre-existing immunity. If you don't have a much pre-existing immunity, the course for you may be very, very different. And then lastly, the PCR being 70% sensitive. I There's probably people who are better able to answer this question. But in essence, what, what I'm meaning there is people. So let's say you know from a sort of God's eye view that this person is positive. The test only comes back positive about 70% of the time. And why that is, well, there's usually when you answer these questions in, in my line of business, there's pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic reasons. So pre-analytic is things like, well, the the you may have got an expired test. You may have not done the reagents correctly. Analytic is the, is, is the, the issue in terms of taking the swab as well. That's a big problem. We know that people don't swab very well. It's the pain, It can be quite painful to do a posterior nasopharyngeal swab. Um, and people often just kind of dab somewhere around the nose and, and try and test that. Uh, and then, of course, the viral load may just not be high enough for the small amount of virus that you got on your swab. And the machine itself has different levels of sensitivity. So it's not surprising that the test isn't 100% sensitive. No test is 100% sensitive. Some tests are very close and very, very good. Um, this one is just averagely good. So it does mean we miss a few. But, uh, but the most of the people, you're much more likely to get missed if your viral load is lower. So we at least are catching most of the infectious people, even if we're not catching almost everyone uh, through this test. Um, thanks very much. I, others may have other answers to that question as well. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. No, thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, and, and I wanted to announce that the, the Minister of Health, Dr. Joe Pata, is um, launching a campaign for youth vaccination program, you know. So that will be the launch for youth vaccination campaign with uh, MEC for Health, Gauteng, and various uh, leaders will be at, uh, at the college, um, South Tibet College. I'll put the address uh, on, the, on the chat. Uh, it will be good if you have uh, some uh, young people in your families or, or those who come to your practice, if you can advise them, the, uh, the campaign will launch tomorrow and um, it will last, I don't know for how long, but this is a very important event. We need to, uh, to, to support it. So uh, on that note, uh, let me um, ask you, uh, Dr. Jeremy Nell, to, to respond uh, electronically now that you've responded to some of the early questions, the rest of the question you could respond electronically. I'm going to hand over to Professor Andy Parrish to uh, moderate the next two presentations. Uh, Dr. Professor Andy Parrish is, um, is the, the chair of, of the NEMLEC NIC, uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee COVID-19 Therapeutics and the current co-chair of NEMLEC um, was previous chair of the adult hospital level EML committee. So he is going to um, moderate the next uh, few uh, two sessions. 
the two cases that we presented, and then it will also bring some insight in terms of the evidence uh, that is considered for our guidelines for the Department of Health. Over to you, uh, Andy Parrish. Yeah, hi, Farrakh. Um, I'm pleased to be able to help you out with these next two sessions. The Department of Health's interest in getting involved with SAMA on this is to try and marry our two um, sets of um, enthusiasms. And certainly from the perspective of the Department of Health, we're quite keen on getting a sort of plug out there for evidence-based approaches to a lot of things we're doing. Um, the theme of these next two talks is um, obstetrics and pediatrics. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do with the EBM link is to show how um, some of these things in evidence can be quite problematic, particularly at the start of an epidemic. So the key um, issues here is evolving evidence. Both of these um, fields, obstetrics and pediatrics, have lagged a bit, not because of any ill will, but because um, patients often aren't enrolled in trials in those two groups. And um, a lot of the original data is observational rather than um, controlled trials. And also because, um, unfortunately, there are a lot of sort of eminence-based recommendations and myths that come out. And these can be quite, quite hard to shake, particularly when they've gained traction on social media. So the idea with these things is to try and get folk together and sort of um, get a bit firmer in terms of the um, evidence that is out there um, for what it is. And um, once the data is in, once we do have quite clean stuff, as we're starting to get now for vaccination in pregnancy, um, we must then um, embrace it and move forward with that. But both our two following speakers will cover those issues in detail. So I'll leave it up to them to carry on. Dr. Jenica is a specialist obstetrician gynecologist with an interest in high-risk um, uh, obstetrics, and she's practicing in KZN and is a Honorary Lecturer Associate with the University of KZN. So very much welcome to her and we look forward to hearing from her. Over to you, Dr. Jenica. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Prof. Parish, for that uh, introduction. So um, welcome to this evening's webinar. Um, I've been requested to speak on COVID-19 in pregnancy and particularly COVID-19 in the ambulatory pregnant woman. So um, let's get started. Um, next, slide, next slide, please. Okay, so the case is, uh, first of all, the first question is, is normal pregnancy a risk factor for COVID-19? Um, and obviously, the, the, you know, with lots of respiratory tract infections and pregnancy, there's always a, it's historically been, there's always been a link between uh, these two and whether they, these, we can actually marry them. The next one is, I'm pregnant, I've tested positive, what should I do? So this goes on to the next uh, bit, which is the clinical outpatient management of COVID-19. And, um, once again, as we mentioned, I mean, COVID-19, it's an evolving disease, and there's been a lot of things in terms of treatment and pr treatment protocols that have come up. Um, and obviously, with the, the, the limitations in pregnancy and how we actually treat or manage these patients based on evidence. So um, I'd like to touch on that. And then the, another important step is, uh, is pregnancy risk factor for more severe disease? And this is not only unique to COVID-19, but a lot of medical disorders in pregnancy in terms of what is the effect of the disease on the pregnancy and what is the actual effect of the pregnancy on the disease. And when we know that, we can actually um, uh, sort of um, um, change the way we manage patients. It also helps us in terms of pregnancy outcomes, maternal outcomes, and going forward. The last thing I'm going to touch on is, um, well, as I said, I'm pregnant. Should I vaccinate? So we're going to do some, uh, some uh, two slides on vaccination. Next slide, please. So WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic around the same time South Africa reported its first case, which was the 5th of March um, 2020. As our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID disease evolves, this has led to advances in prevention management and includes public health and clinical interventions. Despite an abundance of reports related to SARS-CoV-2 infection studies and research in pregnancy remains sparse, and hence most of the treatment guidelines are extrapolated from the general population or observational studies and um, case reports. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to go through very quickly the, uh, these few slides. It's basically um, the symptoms in pregnancy and in the general population is very much similar. And I've seen things we've all seen this slide, and it just looks at the various symptoms of COVID-19. And it isn't much different in pregnancy as well. So fever, dry cough, fatigue being higher up, and then obviously the lower down, we have the other symptoms. Next slide, please. So once again, transmission is also very similar in terms of aerosol spread, in terms of um, droplets. Next slide. And then in terms of screening and triage in patients, right? So um, the virus basically has three stages, or which is uh, you know the initial stage, which is the incubation period where uh, patients are generally asymptomatic. Um, they, they can go on then to have very mild, minor to mild symptoms. And then obviously stage three where they have more severe symptoms and um, may present with respiratory distress and subsequently death. Um, diagnosis is made by various, well, we've, we've, I mentioned this, the, uh, the PCR testing. And it has, um, as mentioned earlier, a, a, false, false, a false negative rate of between 20, 20 to 67%. So next slide, please. So this is a, a DOH initiative, and it's uh, quite um, good in terms of uh, connecting with the general population in terms of uh, the disease and where they are at or the symptoms. So the, on this on the right, right side of the screen, it looks at um, patients can then look at their symptoms. They can type uh, sort of. Uh, uh, typing their symptoms and then they will be actually told what to do in terms of whether to test or um, what uh, what to do next. Um, it also looks at the patient that has tested um, what to do and when they, as soon as they get the result, uh, which is actually very important because we can allow for timeless um, intervention um, and treatment in, in this group. And then the last one is uh, basically what to do when you are come, come into contact with um, patient, uh, with family members or colleagues that are COVID positive. Next slide. So let's move on now to COVID-19 in pregnancy in particular. Uh, so during pregnancy, women experience a lot of immunological and physiological changes that could increase their risk for more severe illness from respiratory infections. And this is not, as I said, unique to COVID-19, but lots of other uh, respiratory tract infections, which include your MERS, your H1N1, uh, SARS, and even um, uh, chicken pox, which is varicella pneumonia. So um, generally women that do develop low respiratory tract inf infections in pregnancy are at risk of more serious uh, disease. Uh, next slide. So data and studies in pregnancy are limited, as we mentioned earlier, and this is not unique with COVID-19, but many of the medical conditions, basically because of ethical implications as well as the concept of vulnerable populations. Um, which is pregnancy and females. Research in pregnancy is dependent on, ex on extrapolation from non-pregnant cohorts, observational studies, case series, and systematic reviews with widespread heterogeneity. And a lot of the data we have to then depend on consensus statement, statements, task force, and expert opinion are then often used. We also use international guidelines like the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as American College of, of uh, Guidelines, as well as your local South African maternity guidelines to assist in guiding clinical practice in pregnant women. Next slide. So the first question we wanted to ask was, is pregnancy a risk factor for COVID-19? And this was a review article that was done by a colleague, Dr. Poswa um, from UKZN. And um, basically normal pregnancy uh, is marked by pro-inflammatory immunological as well as pro-thrombotic changes. It's also marked by marked changes to the respiratory as well as your cardiovascular systems as well. Um, and it has been demonstrated that COVID-19 is an immun immunological condition with reduced lymphocyte and elevated cytokines. Um, we all know that uh, COVID-19 uses the ACE2 receptors as a portal of entry. And it's interesting to note that on the placenta, especially on the maternal side, which is your syncytiotrophoblast, um, the, uh, the, there is increase in abundance of ACE2 receptors. So they might be an, in they, the, can you move on to the next slide? So theoretically, pregnancy may potentiate a woman's risk of COVID-19 infection. Most of the evidence, however, does not support this in the clinical setting. And more studies are needed to investigate the actual link between pregnancy and COVID-19. 
There are controversies with regards to vertical transmission and breastfeeding, and there's no conclusive evidence on this as well. But the general consensus is that breastfeeding should continue and vertical transmission rates are low. Next slide. So what is the clinical management of, for COVID-19 ambulatory setting? So antenatal care is an essential service and must continue. Triaging of patients on symptoms and comorbid conditions. Um, if the patient is unable to self-isolate or she needs admission for an, an, an obstetric indication, we can admit the patient obviously into the facility. If she's stable, very mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, we can actually isolate at home and give her the following advice in terms of rest and adequate fluids. We need to counsel on danger signs that may suggest worsening COVID. The humans need to counsel her to report any evidence of labor, kind of uh, um, counsel her on rupture of membranes. Where women with COVID-19 are also at increased risk of preterm labor, so they need to be aware of this. And we need to provide reassurance and support with access to return to the facility if a complication arises. Next slide. So most women will experience very mild to moderate symptoms. However, there may be a portion of women uh, with comorbid conditions, in particular the high BMI patients and the older women. So high BMI, hypertension, diabetes, and age more than 35 years has been associated with a more um, severe disease uh, or more symptomatic. Um, Steroids, if needed, can be used. Um, steroids is probably, probably the bread and butter of obstetrics. Uh, it's probably one of the drugs that has been most extensively studied in obstetrics um, over the last 20 to 30 years. And um, so generally in obstetrics, we normally use the very potent fluorinated um, steroids, which is either your dexamethasone or um, betamethasone. Uh, but for COVID-19, we suggest using dexamethasone. Uh, antibiotics are used only if there's a bacterial infection suspected. And importantly is to use um, paracetamol or acetaminophen to control fevers. And this is important, especially in the first trimester, because we know that pyrexia in the first trimester can be associated with congenital birth defects. The use of, of non steroidal anti-inflammatories is not really indicated in pregnancy, um, although, and this is not, um, can, it's, well, it says can, sorry, there's a typo, it should not be used in pregnancy. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just an algorithm of exactly what I've said in terms of what we should do. So generally when the woman enters the facility, I, I don't know it projects very well, but um, it's basically when the woman enters the facility, she generally is screened for symptoms. And it's the symptoms that we mentioned at the beginning of, of the presentation. And if she presents with any one of those symptoms or a combination of thereof, she can then be taken to a area where she's examined, the history is taken, and she's then offered a COVID-19 test um, and she will then return in terms depending on the symptoms if it's mild moderate or severe obviously if she's got moderate to severe symptoms she may be admitted um, if she's got very mild symptoms she may be then um, asked to self-isolate at home um, and obviously with the guidance that I have mentioned earlier um, yeah so that's basically it um, next slide please This is just a um, knowledge hub, um, which is I found very useful. It's also a DOH initiative, and it's, it's got many uh, guidelines for healthcare workers in terms of how to manage COVID-19, including the rapid reviews with, the, with all the drugs that have uh, uh, sort of uh, we, we, uh, we've been involved with. So um, those are important. Next slide. So the next um, last, the fourth question I think was, is pregnancy a risk factor for more severe disease? And um, I present um, the study done by Dr. Budram et al, uh, which is 2021, although the data is from uh, sort of the sort of second, the end of the second wave. Um, it was a local multi-center study. So it was conducted throughout South Africa. Um, it was, um, basically to look at the effects of COVID-19 um, and severity of illness. And it was shown that women admitted for COVID-19. So these are women who are admitted specifically for COVID-19 versus women that were uh, pregnant women who were admit admitted for another obstetric indication. They were more likely to need critical care and die than those admitted for another medical indication. 
and uh, the, the the results were quite statistically significant in terms of um, needing critical care. 32.8 percent in the COVID-19 group uh, versus 8.6 percent in the other, with a uh, p-value of zero less than zero comma zero 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 one. And then for the um, for mortality, it was 14.7 percent versus 1.8 percent, and that was also statistically significant. Budram et al. also reported a 61 percent of women admitted were obese, and one third was 35 years and older. And as we mentioned earlier, those were two significant risk factors for more severe disease. Um, the limitations of the study, however, was the fact that it lacked a comparator group, and most of the data, as I said, was collected much earlier in the pandemic. Um, although the, the article, this article was published in 2021. Next slide, please. So I'm going to present this case report on a poor maternal outcome. Uh, it was a 27-year-old para-1 gravida 2. She was 32 weeks pregnant. She was a known asthmatic. She had no other comorbidities. Um, she developed a two-day history of cough and fever and progressive worsening of symptoms and dyspnea or shortness of breath. Uh, she treat, was treated at a private hospital um, as an inpatient. And however, she required upscale of respiratory support and unable to maintain SATs above 90. Next slide, please. She was then discussed with Albert Lituli Hospital, where I'm based, um, for takeover of management due to her medical due to medical aid restrictions. However, the patient arrived in the obstetric high care, which was brought in by paramedics. She then developed a cardiac arrest immediately on arrival, necessita necessitating advanced CPR. And she was intubated with return uh, of spontaneous circulation of the two cycles. She was then uh, transferred to our COVID ICU. Um, ultrasound on, was done, and unfortunately, the fetal heart was negative, and that confirmed an intrauterine fetal death. The patient then went on to deliver a macerated stillbirth on day three in ICU, and she demised after a pro prolonged ICU stay. Next slide. So although 75% of pregnant women may be asymptomatic, um, and they actually have no symptoms. Um, but there is the, the percentage, especially those that are admitted for COVID-19 and with, with or without comorbid conditions, we may be at risk of more severe disease. Um, this was also supported by a rapid review by Mullins et al., um, as well as the umbrella review by Cipriani et, et al., which reported similar outcomes, including increased maternal adverse events and poor perinatal outcome. And this stresses the importance of um, symptomatic pregnant women should be identified and therefore seek early medical attention. And they should also therefore be prioritized in vaccination programs. Next slide. So this is just the updated circular in terms of vaccination on pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, which was updated on the 25th of June, 2021. Next slide, please. And the key messages on vaccines. Um, so basically the vaccines that we offer to all our pregnant ladies are either the P Pfizer or Janssen and uh, J&J vaccine, which is a single shot. Um, and they, these are offered to all pregnant women, either in the antenatal period as well as the postpartum period. Um, cost, uh, consideration should be given to providing vaccination to pregnant and breastfeeding women as well. There is not this, where this is not possible, uh, we should encourage these women to seek access to uh, nearby vaccination uh, site. Um, next slide. So the key messages um, is international bodies, including the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology, as well as Royal College, agree that the risk of maternal mortality has not shown to be as lethal as MERS and SARS. However, pregnant women should know that they are more at risk of severe disease. Vaccination with non-live, and this is particular in women with comorbid conditions. Uh, vaccination with non-live vaccines are safe in pregnancy. Uh, the fetus will benefit as well from the transplacental immune transfer of antibodies. And we can reassure the woman of the growing body of evidence suggesting safety. Um, from everyday practice, one of the things we do see is not necessarily an aversion to want to take the vaccine, but more sort of hesitancy in terms of the vaccine, especially when pregnant women often feel that, um, that it, will, it will harm the baby or it will harm the pregnancy in any way. So it's important to actually um, give them that reassurance. Women need to understand the importance of safe practices after vaccination as well. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks very much, Dr. Jenica. You went through that very smoothly and um, we are delighted to hear all that information um, portrayed so succinctly and so concisely. The issues really are um, some things on the chats which we can 
come to now. Um, there aren't that many questions at the moment related to this, but a few of them are interesting. Um, I think we could um, ask you to comment on a couple and maybe Jeremy will chip in as well on some of the vaccine related ones. Um, the one that obviously is the first up there is this J&J Pfizer heterologous booster story where you've had one and then you want the other one after that. Um, the issue around that is mainly um, proof that the heterologous use of these vaccines actually is effective and that's still in the pipeline as it were. And I'm sure Jeremy will comment on that as well. Um, then there's the question around um, conditions in pregnancy, which would be contraindications to vaccines, if there are any. And um, the issue around um, testing of parents of caregivers of children admitted with a child who's got the illness. Um, but I'll leave it up to Dr. Jenica and Dr. Um, Nell to take that further if they'd like to. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, so I think in terms of um, the question regarding uh, pregnancy, sorry, what was the question again? It was regarding? Well, there's one question about which vaccines or what, what would be contraindications to vaccination oh, contra in yeah. pregnancy? Um, so there are no uh, known contraindications to vaccination in pregnancy. Um, uh, they, I mean, um, um, there's no sort of, uh, you'd say that you would not be able to take the vaccine uh, because of, um, I mean, we, the, 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 the concerns with the vaccine um, in terms of um, in pregnancy per se, uh, this risk of venous thromboembolism and those kind of things are sort of, most of, the, most of that has been sort of, uh, it's not, there's no pr proven evidence that that, that that actually happens. So there's no evidence to say that um, uh, there's a contraindication per se for any particular disease, no. Mm. Yeah, thanks. And I'm sure that Jeremy would want to chip in too there, but essentially it's the same as in non-pregnant people. So if you're allergic mm -hmm. to particular constituents of a vaccine, those would be the sort of things that would arise there too. But there's nothing pregnancy specific as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, have you got any thoughts? Uh, no, I think that that's perfectly said. I, I put in the chat an answer from the CDC, which has a, a nice uh, collection which I find pretty useful, um, but it's, it's exactly as you say. Really, the only contraindication is uh, is a known or anticipated allergy to one of the and a major allergic reaction to one of the vaccine constituents. Um, and then, obviously, you know, in the case of the J and J vaccine, the particular issue about the uh, the VITT. But really, really, that it's extremely limited. And, and people always, I get a lot of questions. And I'm sure everyone on the panel does about people saying. I'm immunocompromised, I've got lupus, I've got diabetes, I've got heart disease, I've got cancer. Can I take the vaccine? And the answer, of course, is yes. And in fact, it's the most important people. They should be in front of the queue. So that, that's a really big thing to get right in terms of the messaging. Is it, you know, These vaccines are most important for the most vulnerable. Um, they're important for everyone, but the most vulnerable really should be at the front of the queue. So if you're wondering about your health and wondering whether you should get a vaccine, the answer is yes unless you have an extremely rare thing in terms of these uh, known severe allergic reaction to one of the, one of the vaccine constituents. Uh, thanks. The other question is where these vaccines are being offered and whether they're being offered at antenatal clinics. Um, my understanding in the public sector is that mostly they're being offered at sites that are set up as vaccine sites because there's a cold chain requirements and things like that. So if anybody else wants to chip in on that, they're welcome to do so. Yeah, I agree. It is uh, in the public sector. It is basically at sites where uh, specific sites. Um, Albany Tuli is a vaccine center, so we do vaccinate on um, at the, the hospital, but it's generally a, a specific site. No, great. Um, I think um, that's really helpful. So, Dr. G um, Jenica, you've helped us along with the pregnancy side of things. Just to keep the ball rolling, we'll now move on. And our last speaker for the evening is Dr. Uh, Prof. McLaughlin, who's going to talk to us about multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And she's a um, pediatric nephrologist and pediatric intensivist at Red Cross, and has obviously been very interested in this whole process and has been working also as past president of the Pediatric Association of South Africa. So I leave it up to her to take 
work you through the syndrome, which folk have found interesting. And I think there is some relevance of it, both from an evidence perspective, but also in the fact that it's quite topical. Parents are very concerned about it. And obviously, it is um, a very serious condition when it does happen. So over to you then, Prof McLaughlin. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to thank the organisers um, for inviting us to speak on behalf of SARPA. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Andy. Um, I really want to thank the audience because it's late in the day and I see there's still a, a large number of people and I hope that I can actually share some wisdom with you. So, um, paediatric multi-system inflammatory disease, so MIS-C um, is what it's called. My disclosures are that we've worked very closely with Kate Webb and Chris Scott, paediatric rheumatologists across the board, Red Cross and Tigerberg Children's COVID study groups. Cheryl Cohn and Wasila Jassat from the NICD have been amazing. The SARPA executive have had a real interest in this, and I'm going to come back to that later. And we've even had the president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and Dr. Farchi from the USA contact us to share wisdom because everybody was feeling so nervous about the Omicron virus specifically. So. Um, uh, the BMJ came up with why is Africa's pandemic different? This was in the early days. And then with the Omicron virus, I think everybody got really excited about it. Uh, we can see here as of the 11th of February, um, these are the waves that we've had. I'm sure you've seen these slides earlier this evening and the deaths that we've had in South Africa. Fortunately, very few of those have happened in children. Um, and if you look at this data, which is uh, from Wasila, shows the different waves. And if you look here, the green is over the age of 19. Um, and then the younger ages are orange, red, black and blue. You can see what's different about the current Omicron um, wave has been that the younger children have had a higher peak than in previous times. So the under ones have definitely um, been infected with this, but fortunately, not many of them have been terribly ill. So some have been uh, admitted to hospital for some oxygen, but very few have actually needed ventilation. And we did a study in December and January, a snapshot on a specific day in December and January, and found in December 10 children across the entire country in ICU. And in January, only 21 kids combined in the whole country. So fortunately, children were not being admitted in large waves like we saw with adults in the early days. So pediatric inflammatory syndrome, it was called PIMS in the beginning in Britain and in Europe and in America, they called it MIS-C and now it's been called MIS-C across the whole world. So we've changed our nomenclature. Um, the WHO came up with a case report form and basically it's anybody 0 to 19 with a fever for more than three days and two of the following. So either a rash, conjunctivitis or uh, red swollen hands and feet and, and lips or hypertension and shock or features of myocardial dysfunction. So pro-BNP would be raised or evidence of coagulopathy, so elevated D-dimers, similar to adults, or acute gastrointestinal problems. Now, I really want to just emphasize that, that diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain, which unfortunately is such a common symptom in children not even related to COVID, is a major um, symptom in these kids. They should also then have an elevated mark of inflammation, such as an ESR or a CRP, and no other obvious microbial causes. So we've had some children who've come back as blood culture positive for staph sepsis or even um, for other infections, and that would then exclude it from being a MIS-C. And then the evidence of COVID is that ideally you should have a serology positive or an antigen positive or a PCR, but in the face of a pandemic, any contact with anybody. So that actually doesn't really hold. So anybody who gets MIS-C in the face of a pandemic would actually have some kind of contact, which you may not even know about because they may be asymptomatic. So let's make it easy. Let's look at a case study. An eight-year-old boy presents with abdominal pain. Remember, I, I emphasized that in diarrhea. Generalized, but possibly increased in the right iliac fossa. So concerned about appendicitis. Temperature 38.5, a tachycardia 120 for an eight year old is up, a raised white cell count, a CRP which was 200, and the abdominal ultrasound showed um, no obvious appendix pathology. And the COVID PCR in this case was positive. 
So he was assessed as having a suspected appendicitis taken to theatre and at the time they found a lily white appendix but inflamed bowel. He was then diagnosed as Miss C, treated with intravenous immunoglobulin and the dose we use is 2 grams per kilogram, divided into 2 doses of 1 milligram per kilogram per day for 24 hours and then a repeat for another 24 hours. He improved really rapidly and was discharged home after 5 days. So that would really be a case that we saw quite commonly. Um, the next case would be a seven-year-old girl. So you'll note a lot of these kids with Miss C are quite old. They're not little kids under two. On the whole, they're sort of older children. This one was well-grown and many of our children were well-grown. We didn't see many children with Miss C that were malnourished. Presents feeling unwell with fevers. Interesting, the mom had had COVID two weeks previously. Again, a tachycardia for a seven-year-old of 130, pyrexia of 39, a very faint rash with red eyes and swollen red lips, white cell count raised at 15, CRP raised at 180, D-dimers positive, the inflammatory markers fibrinogen and ferritin also raised, and the pro-BNP very raised. Now, as pediatricians, we didn't often used to do pro-BNP on children, but in the case of COVID suspicion, we have actually been doing that. Interestingly, the COVID was negative on this child, but she had had an exposure at home. She was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin, but her CRP did not really improve much. And so following her two days of immunoglobulin, she was treated with methylprednisolone, 10 mg per kilo per day for three days, with complete resolution of clinical signs. Cardiac echo was fortunately normal with no coronary vessel abnormalities and we can sometimes see Kawasaki's disease which masquerades as this and again she was discharged home well. Um, sorry my slides seem to be jumping. Um, so going back, oh dear, sorry can I just reload my talk quickly it seems to, I'm just going to quickly escape. Um, um, sorry, it just seems to have, uh, let's just, Okay, so um, going back to that table that I showed you in the beginning, you can see both the kids had a fever for three days. They each, the one had a rash, the one had the abdominal pain. Many had inflammatory markers with a CRP raise, blood cultures both negative, and one had evidence of COVID, the other one didn't, but had had a family exposure. Sorry, my slides seem to have a bug in them. Um, so we then wrote up the first um, case series in the Lancet of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in South African children. Uh, we had um, a number of cases at the Red Cross Children's Hospital. You can see that they happened with all the waves over the time period of two years. Uh, their signs were fever, tachycardia, rash, hypertension, conjunctivitis, and abdominal pain. Um, few had diarrhea, and then we had some with arthritis, headache, and these symptoms were far rare. But important for the audience is that fever, tachycardia, and a rash with some abdominal pain in children is a warning sign that this may be a miss so treatment controversies, we've used intravenous methylprednisolone. Some people have used high-dose oral steroids, specifically in countries in Africa where they haven't had intravenous methylpred. Intravenous immunoglobulin has also been used. Some centers in, in North America and in Europe have used the um, IL-1 and IL-6 antagonists. Uh, with which are obviously a lot more expensive and uh, Professor Mike Levine, an infectio infectious disease specialist, um, is actually trying to do a trial to see which of these are the best for, for Miss C. Obviously in our setting either oral steroids or intravenous steroids would be a lot cheaper, intravenous immunoglobulin obviously being a lot more expensive.
Sorry guys, I don't know why my slides are doing this tonight. Um, so um, importantly, the treatment and the outcomes of our patients. So 60% uh, needed oxygen, 40% needed inotropic support, but we manage them in high cares. Only a third were admitted to ICU with only 13% needing invasive ventilation. We did do peritoneal dialysis on some and across the country. I know there were some centers that even use CVVH in children, but on the whole, our children got mainly immunoglobulin, 50% got methylpred, and only 10% needed tozolizumab um, as, as an agent to try and stop this disease process. The good news is that we had an average duration stay of nine days. So a few only stayed for two days with a, um, a stretch all the way to 23 days. And this is just a graph to show you ward admissions predominant, a few needing ICU or high care, only very few needed non-invasive ventilation with only 4% needing invasive ventilation and inotropes. So the good news for the audience is if these kids are picked up early and their CRPs are done and you can see that there's an increased inflammation, either using steroids or immunoglobulin actually treats this condition really effectively. Um, the clinical s signs and symptoms that we've used for Red Cross, uh, which we've used for pediatrics in South Africa, is very similar to the WHO, so the signs that we've used before, but we've said any evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection and in the face of a pandemic, um, any proven contact, even if the patient is negative. Importantly, signs in South Africa of tachycardia, conjunctivitis and abdominal pain is a sign that this is a concern and you could be dealing with one of these conditions. Um, the other agents that we used, we used aspirin, we used some vitamin D supplementation. I've spoken about the intravenous immunoglobulin, we've spoken about steroids and a signs of an adequate response would be an, a temperature that settled, normal heart rate and cardiac function and a reduced CRP. So just important as a take home message, watch out for fever, rash, red eyes or mouth and abdominal pain, specifically a tachycardia. And often pediatricians um, forget that the bigger children, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year olds who have a tachycardia of 120, 150, that's really important with a low BP, suggests impending shock. An acute abdomen is not necessarily an appendicitis during the COVID era. Um, and you don't have to have a history of a COVID contact. So we would then call that a MIS-C. We would use either immunoglobulin or methylprednisolone. And if you've got a blood culture positive, it's not a PIMS or a MIS-C. And the take home message from our point of view is to create awareness, to have local treatment guidelines, which we've put together. It is now a notifiable condition. And we have got the bigger centers doing data collection and international collaboration with um, big centers like the UK to see what is the best treatment for this condition. And then just in the last phases of my discussion, just to show the work that the South African Pediatric Association has done, we've done some statements. So returning of South African children to school as early as May of 2020. We then also looked at the care of children in South Africa. So often children were being refused um, access to their parents during the COVID pandemic because uh, children with COVID, um, people were nervous as they were with the adults that they would spread it. But we've actually managed to encourage most hospitals and clinics to allow at least one parent in with their child. Um, we've also encouraged early childhood development programs to continue. We then had the second wave and we also encouraged return of kids to school during this period. I was really encouraged and enjoyed the previous talk about vaccination of pregnant uh, and breastfeeding women. Um, also the vaccination of 12 to 17 year old, this was in November last year. And I was interested last night to hear that the UK has just introduced five to 11 year old vaccination. So it'll be interesting to see what we decide in our country about that age group. Returning to school, it's been catastrophic. We've had a decrease in vaccine delivery. School is not just about education, it's about safety, physical, psychological, and safety from sexual abuse. And lots of schools actually have food um, feeding schemes. So 
and it's not just in low middle income countries. The UK has actually published this that said it's the child's right to have safe, nutritious and culturally appropriate food during and beyond the COVID pandemic. We've had lots of discussions with departments of health and, and um, uh, teachers trade unions that have actually we worked really well together. We've also put out a statement about ambulatory care for children with COVID when we saw the Omicron wave because many more children were getting COVID, not very severely, but it actually did put a big strain on the health services. And we actually gave some practical advice in terms of directed therapy, supportive monitoring and investigations. So um, mandatory masks, there's been a, a big discussion recently across the world about whether masks should happen. We encourage vaccination and here you can see this is a, a painting called the cowpox from 1802 with a healthcare worker administering a vaccine to a woman and you can see there's quite a lot of chaos going on around her and we've really worked hard at debunking the myths about vaccination. Um, in the UK there was a lot of concern because children could get vaccines without their parents permission. We've actually really tried to encourage that and a little bit like this cartoon strip where the older sister takes responsibility for her brother getting the vaccine. Um, we've also encouraged, as with the previous speaker, that vaccinations in children who have had other comorbidities is really important, even much more so than children who've got no comorbidities. So really important to get all those kids with chronic lung disease, with oncology problems, with transplants to get them to have a vaccine. And at the end of the day, I really like the serene picture where somebody's wearing a mask and they've got a, a little heart over the arm where they've actually had their vaccine. So uh, we were also part of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, which came out at the end of January, getting kids back to school. Um, and in terms of a package of care, so not just being concerned about social or physical distancing, but good ventilation, not worrying too much about thermal screening um, and really just getting people to wear masks and to get vaccinated, both the teachers as well as the teenagers and those with comorbidities. So I just want to thank you very much for your time and attention. Apologies that my slides seem to do their own thing, but hopefully I've got the message across. Thank you very much. Thanks, Prof McCulloch. That was great. It was a lovely um, introduction to both the um, uh, MISC uh, debate, but also the issue of where the pediatricians have been putting their um, pressure on for all these other issues. So thank you for doing that. That was very helpful. Um, the only questions we have are really a few about the rash, um, where does it manifest, and some things about um, whether you could give IVIG as an outpatient and then a question about vaccines for over the fives in South Africa. But I think that um, if there are any other questions people have, please put them on. There's another one about thromboprophylaxis if um, D dimers are high. So I don't know if you want to address all of some of those, Prof McCullough, and then you okay. can spread it to the other panelists as well. Okay, sure. so let's start with the rash. So the rash that we've seen has been a very fine red morbilliform rash often with swollen hands and feet and often swollen lips and, and quite a red swollen tongue. Um, but together with a fever, um, I think an outpatient management, if your patient is well, we've suggested the usual stuff that you would do. So your airway breathing circulation. So if your child is not tachycardic, they've got a normal blood pressure, they're still eating and drinking well, by all means, you don't need to get too worried. If the child is sick enough with a tachycardia and a low BP needing admission, you would be doing some bloods, you would be doing a CRP or a PCT, whichever you've got available to you. Um, and only if your CRP is significantly raised and you are clinically really unwell would we actually venture in with some immunoglobulin. We've often just watched these kids for a day or two to see which way they've gone. So. You know, in the whole series, I think there have been about 100 children in the whole country with um, significant MIS-C that have actually needed um, treatment. So that's been quite encouraging for us. Um, just remind me, the last question was? About anticoagulation. Yeah, so that's from a very... Her, from a yeah. 
That's a very interesting one. In the beginning, we were quite heavy handed um, and we followed our adult colleagues. Um, and one of the first patients that I actually did peritoneal dialysis on, we actually had on Clexane and aspirin. And he then had a bit of a bleed. So for children on the whole, we've actually um, gone aspirin if they haven't been too severe or um, Clexane low molecular weight heparin only if they are really critically ill, they've had uh, a significantly uh, impaired hemodynamics um, and they've been admitted to hospital. So we haven't put all the kids on um, prophylactic uh, aspirin or Clexane by any means. No, thank you, uh, that's great. I mean, there's a one last question that's popped up while you were talking about myocarditis, the incidence yeah. of myocarditis in children um, with COVID, not with MISC. Um, I don't know if you want to say. So happy to do that. So all the kids that we did treat with immunoglobulin or steroids would anything have- Anything about that, that's slightly off the topic there. It's, um, yeah, they would have got a cardiac echo during their admission, um, just to make sure that they didn't have a myocarditis. So a clinical myocarditis would have a tachycardia and would have a low BP. Um, we have not seen that many normal children without a tachycardia with a myocarditis. There's also been a little bit of a concern about the Pfizer vaccine in boys, but when you actually look at the stats, the, those boys, if they actually got the COVID um, infection, had far higher, about 400 times higher incidence of actually having um, a myocarditis related to the actual virus itself rather than the vaccine. So um, our recommendation is definitely to get the vaccine. Um, there is a risk in some boys of getting um, myocarditis, but they would normally be quite ill. And so our, um, our sort of baseline guidelines would be examine your patient, look at their pulse rate, look at their capillary refill, do a blood pressure on them. And if those are all normal um, and they look clinically well, you probably don't need to go any further in terms of further blood tests or any um, further imaging. But if your patient is sick, definitely like you would with adults, you would actually do some blood tests, do your inflammatory markers and um, definitely try and get a cardiac uh, examination during their admission. Thanks very much, Professor McCulloch. I think you've covered all the questions that have come up there that are related to your topic. We have a few more minutes if people have any burning questions. There are a few that are slightly off the topic, um, which is about vaccinations rollout for GPs and things like that. But um, I think that if there's anything else that the panelists want to chip in with as a group um, on any of the questions, that have come up, please feel free to do so. Um, otherwise, um, if there's nothing else that comes up, I think we should base. Yeah, go for it. I was there just going to say, I've just spotted the is vaccines on the horizon for over five. So from the beginning, we've actually encouraged that those most at risk must get the vaccine. So we've really encouraged older folks with comorbidities to be first in the line. Um, and then we've worked our way down. We, in the beginning, have encouraged the teenagers to get it only after the adults with comorbidities have had it. But we do know that teenagers like to uh, gather in groups or flocks. I'm not sure what you call a collective group of teenagers, probably a flock of teenagers. Um, and so because we're trying to get teenagers to go back to normal living, we've encouraged the teenagers then to be vaccinated as well. Um, the five to 11 year olds are far less at risk of getting severe COVID or Omicron for that matter. But I think what it will make a difference is that those children between five and 11 with comorbidities, we would try and prioritize for vaccines. So it will open the door for those children, the children with oncology problems, with chronic illnesses, um, and eventually, as they are doing in the UK, it's probably not a bad idea to vaccinate the five to 11 year olds, but I still think we need to really try and encourage the older population with comorbidities to try and be fully vaccinated before we concentrate on the five to 11 year olds. So I don't know if that answers that question. Um, so we're not, we're not against it, but we're just saying, let's just prioritize the older folks first. Thanks. That's a very really sensible reply. I mean, it fits in with the stuff that's just come out of Israel a couple of days ago, showing that if you vaccinate both parents, 
you reduce the chance of the children getting it too, which makes a lot of sense. And there's also a better use of the vaccine. Um, all right, I think that then, thanks very much to the two panelists who I was helping with the um, uh, moderation on. And so it's back to, uh, and thanks very much for your time, for helping us out and for great talks. So it's back to Dr. Njeka now and um, uh, Dr. Clark in terms of um, closing out. Thanks very much for your help, guys. Okay. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Professor Andy Parish, for a great moderation. Uh, we, we really enjoyed um, this evening. We've had three powerful talks. Uh, the, the first one from Dr. Jeremy Nell, uh, looking at the um, guidance on case management. And he, he took us through the testing, isolation, and quarantine issues. And it was very clearly stated that the um, the isolation period has <clears throat> changed from 10 to 7 days. I think our minister also uh, alluded to that. So we isolate 7 days for people who are symptomatic. No isolation for asymptomatic individuals. In fact, he was even discouraging. Uh, he said we should move, move away from testing uh, people who are asymptomatic uh, you know so i think this is the area where we need to 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 pay more attention we don't know what is coming next but i think it's very clear now that uh, uh, covid is here to stay with us and we need to find a way to live with uh, with covid the, the second talk was uh, from dr jenica very interesting talk uh, around vaccination in pregnant women i think there have been a lot of confusion um, earlier on, people thinking that pregnant mothers should not be vaccinated and all that. And then she clearly showed to us that there are benefits even to the babies when mothers are vaccinated. So we really need to uh, look at this uh, very serious and, and encourage uh, pregnant mothers who come to our practice and to, to vaccinate, to be vaccinated. The final talk was around pediatrics, and we really enjoyed this from Professor McCulloch, who um, explained the symptomatology in, in terms of uh, children. We, we know that this can be different, but I think we call the details. Sometimes it's an acute abdomen. When you cut, then you see something else. Uh, so we need to be very careful when we examine children. Um, uh, emphasis was made on fever, rash, red eyes, tachycardia. Those are the things you should be looking at. I think our own vaccination program recommend vaccination from 12 to 17. Um, but we heard from Prof that 5 to 11 are now being vaccinated in the UK. So we need to watch this space and see what's going to happen uh, in our own um, in our own uh, country. And um, today we didn't talk much about uh, opportunities for further research. Uh, I think last time we we alluded to this, but as we engage more. We need to be thinking about uh, various research projects that can be done in the various uh, practices. It was a good idea that was raised in the previous uh, meeting. So we need to see if it's possible you know, to, to follow this up with a lot of academics who can support some practices and work on some uh, projects. We practice evidence-based medicine and we wouldn't want people to do things haphazardly, but if there are ideas which uh, are into protocols of research and all that, you know, those can be supported uh, moving forward. So on that note, colleagues, uh, this has come to an end. Uh, I thank all the speakers once more. I thank Prof. Andy Parish. I thank Trudy Leong and all the colleagues from Affordable Medicine and, and all that are from the Department of Health who have, whom I've seen are still on this call. Uh, we thank you for your support. Uh, please uh, come to this event, the event. We will have a follow-up uh, webinar on Knowledge Hub. Uh, the date and time will be uh, announced.
um, through the um, Knowledge Hub uh, platform. So this has come to an end. And um, I'd like to invite the, uh, the colleagues on the call to stay for uh, a short survey. Uh, please don't drop when we when the panelists leave, please stay and, and go through a survey. Thank you so much, Sama, for availing your platform. Uh, it has been really a pleasure to work with you uh, with these two webinars. Uh, we planned two. We're moving to the Knowledge Hub, but uh, maybe if there are opportunities, we don't mind collaborating with you in future. It's really a pleasure working with Sama. Thank you so much. This has come to an end. Goodbye.